Welcome to our webinar this evening on renovating Appleby Moot Hall. I'm Tina Holt and our presenter for this evening is Paul Crosby of Crosby Granger Architects. So I'm going to start with a short introduction about CAFs and, and to introduce Paul and then he'll start with the presentation um, on the, the Moot Hall and all the activities that have been going on behind the scaffolding over the last several months. Then towards the end we'll have time for questions and answers and then at the very end I'll wrap up with a poll and uh, a few bits and pieces of information. So I expect many of you are familiar with Cumbria Action for Sustainability. Um, we have, we don't just do webinars on retrofit or renovation of, of buildings. We have a whole wide range of projects and I would encourage you if you're not already familiar with CAFs to go to our website and take a look around and to see the, the range of, of activities and projects that we have um, underway at the moment. I work within the energy services team and on that team we do a number of different things. We have free services and free projects. So, for example, people who are eligible can get energy efficiency advice by phone and even with a home visit. Uh, and we do free draft proofing for those people. Many of you might be interested to know that you can get advice on your own home, a short general advice phone call on a specific question. And that's for anyone within Cumbria, whether you've got a question about insulation or a particular renewable technology, we can take a short call on that. Or if you're thinking of a whole house retrofit, then we can do a free 30 minute consultation by phone as well. So do take advantage of that if it's going to be useful for you. On the other side, we do have paid for services. So we do a full whole house energy audit with a whole house plan. Uh, we do thermal imaging services as well. Those, those are not free though, those, those are paid for. And we often run courses and webinars like this one, sometimes, um, we're fortunate and this time we've got funding from Energy Redress, which means we can offer these webinars for free at the moment. Um, and any donations that you've made when you book on, we are very grateful for because that means CAFs can do more um, and it means our, our funding goes further. So Paul Crosby is um, set up or helped to set up Crosby Granger Architects back in 2014. Um, and as you can see, it has worked on a wide range of different kinds of projects. Um, obviously, as you might expect, looking at Appleby Moot Hall, his uh, area of specialism is the uh, repair and conservation of historic buildings. And it, there's a lot of work on those in the Lake District and Yorkshire Dales. And he's a member of the Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings and provides technical, technical advice there. So that's, that's really where a lot of people who work in traditional buildings get their um, knowledge from is by being members of the society. And he's also doing some interesting charity work in India, um, which uh, I haven't said much about there, but, uh, but that's another little extra, um, I think that you're busy with as well at the moment. Mm -hmm. So over to you, Paul, I will stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours. Okay. Okay. Well, hello, hello. My name is Paul Crosby, as uh, you know, has just very, very kindly introduced me. Um, yes, I'm a conservation accredited architect and deal with historic buildings but we I, th I think it probably goes for most uh, conservation architects we do uh, enjoy using traditional materials and traditional techniques which in and of themselves are often possibly the most sustainable uh, of um, of materials and technologies to use but it, it's it's not always that way there are modern um, influences in in the in the way that we work now which allow us to um, have a kind of broader scope of materials i think the critical thing and hopefully the the point that i'd like to get across tonight is that um, modern materials can be used but we have to be considerate of how they work and function and how appropriate they are in a historic setting such as the moot hall in appleby 
So I've um, I've set up a, a selection of slides to go through uh, the challenges that we've faced at Moot Hall, and and hopefully some of these will relate to general uh, retrofitting. Obviously, it's quite a niche. Uh, we've got a grade uh, two star building, which is um, from the uh, the seventeenth century and uh, has is quite a specific use to it. So it's it's not uh, not your average building. But some of the some of the small changes that we've tried to do within quite a restricted um, framework here are are ostensibly done to improve and enhance the way that the building functions and uh, and to improve its kind of thermal uh, response without uh, or not to the detriment of the historic fabric. So I'll, I'll, I'll run through my slides and I will try to keep to the, the time scale. I've got a lot of slides, but uh, and, and hopefully they are relevant to to uh, to you guys. So with all of our projects, our first port of call is to assess the significance of the building, to uh, to understand how it works, to understand uh, Yes, it's his history and its evolution and how the building came to be what it is today, but also that that, that sort of gives us an idea of um, of the material construction and uh, maybe the friability of certain or sensitivity of certain elements of that building. Um, and uh, the significance can give us a an opportunity in certain instances where we can find out that we're looking at fairly modern uh, potentially inappropriate sometimes uh, work which we can maybe unpick um, and historic fabric that we really want to be looking at and taking care of and trying maybe to better understand why the problem what has come about what the problem is so, uh, so, so I'm just showing you some kind of lovely photographs of Appleby to uh, to, to show how the Moot Hall had looked um, and how it's evolved. So, perhaps looking back at this one, the the main body of the the building, that which is in the foreground, was from the 17th century. Although, as later slides will show, that building was manipulated and changed uh, even before it was added to at the the, the far end. Uh, with an 18, 1800 addition and, and then shops put underneath it. Uh, and, and interesting, lots of chimneys, lots of fireplaces in this building, which obviously heated it, but also were a, were a way of um, inadvertently giving good air changes and ventilation to the space. So this is the, um, the north end, which has now been converted into the tourist information centre, which uh, which is part of the joy that it's kept, uh, got lots of use to it, and it's, it's still part of the, uh, the heart of the community, but because of bookshelves and displays and permanent uh, fixtures, a lot of the walls have effectively been dry lined. So uh, this, this has challenges in, in what we just talked about, ventilation and uh, potential deterioration of, um, of the fabric behind that uh, appears to be all good and well because they're you know throwing lots of heat into the building but actually these hidden spaces these cavities can then become quite uh, quite an issue uh, in terms of interstitial condensation we're learning more and more that um, these cavities and how that interstitial condensation and the dew points how it's affected by uh, by insulation whether that's external insulation or internal insulation Kind of regardless of whether it's good insulation or bad insulation but that dew point can uh, can move around in in a wall something which is only is uh, is only really being started to be understood and how that affects uh, moisture travel and uh, and condensation so cavities on the whole we are learning are um, are potentially dangerous traps for for moisture for this interstitial condensation so our first step, as I said, was to, to look at the significance of the building. Uh, thankfully, uh, the Moot Hall is, is you know, it's a, it's a high level building uh, and uh, we got uh, grants, grants aiding for this building to allow us to, uh, to explore the significance quite well. But it doesn't need to be a uh, high grade. It can be something which, um, you know, just looking at the fabric of your building, whether it's got uh, coins, which might suggest that uh, a wall has been extended or, or when you 
pick off um, a, a render which is causing damp that you then start to expose elements which can um, give you hints as to what was there in the first place here because it was rendered um, it was very difficult other than to know that the render itself we sampled the render and found that it uh, surprisingly although everybody thought it was quite historic actually the render on the hall was in fact um, a cementitious render and therein lies part of the problem so uh, with that level of significance that we that i was just talking about historic england employed to we then ourselves did a, a condition survey of the building to try and assess the condition of these varying uh, varying elements and so this was our uh, they're quite small i'm afraid but you can kind of get an idea of the fact that we were picking out elements which were, uh, were which were suspect or causing issues and interestingly around these buildings uh, the the left hand side of the screen uh, this is a slightly later part of the building and had had um, concrete um, insertions into the wall and then being covered with the cementitious render which was trapping water so details around windows are kind of quite critical uh, because they are um, although they're the kind of windows and the eyes out of the building they're also uh, windows and doors are quite a, a weak point especially within a solid masonry wall because uh, cold bridging and transfer of moisture is a real issue in these areas and uh, you know doing thermal imaging which we didn't actually do on the hall but we have done and would encourage people to do on other buildings have a has a real insight into uh, to leakage um, and, and when done with a pressure test as well it can really accentuate where where a building is where a building is failing so these were our initial condition survey uh, drawings which identified defects which then became uh, a kind of start to uh, how we wanted to propose changes and we started to see also start to see trends within the building and not unsurprisingly the, the bits of the building which were dry lined for shops uh, when we actually put an endoscope into them they, the, the spaces behind were quite damp and the 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 original line plaster was either very damp or had actually come away from the wall so uh, a, a lot of encouragement there for the owners to rethink how they use the space um, and I know these are shops but but it can be for for, for any space I suppose kitchens bathrooms are probably the, uh, the the main offenders in domestic properties we use a lot of things which create a lot of moisture and that uh, one of the, the major things that we have to take into consideration is kind of controlled ventilation to allow um, to allow the, the original fabric to behave in a, in a way that it was intended to be. We can't force upon a solid masonry wall the uh, the performance of a um, highly insulated cavity wall. So in these places, you know, retrofitting is 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 uh, is quite a sensitive process, which uh, you have to be aware of the implications of what you're doing. So once we'd identified the um, the defects we went into um, proposals how we were going to repair these and the most obvious thing at moot hall was that the cement render was causing water to trap in the walls so it's not a case of um, a devastating uh, decay or, or or holes or obvious elements of uh, poor design it's just simply microporous cracks within a very brittle case which once the cracks uh, start to appear by capillary they draw in the water and as everybody in Cumbria knows we have a lot of wind driven rain um, so it's uh, it then can feed in to the fabric and of course the fabric and its lime uh, bedding will accept this water but because of the, uh, the the cement render on the outside, there is no uh, scope for evaporation of that water. So it tends to just build up, and over time, this then becomes uh, quite problematic, and it starts to show itself inside. Actually, here we had uh, a further um, issue, and this is normally 
because it's not a surprise, but here it's quite a specific thing, is that the, the hat of your building is, is quite a critical thing. Um, and it might be, you know, here we had uh, parapets, copings, which had, um, interestingly, this building had been re-roofed in the, in the 80s, so not that long ago. Uh, and surprisingly, they had been allowed to use uh, non-vernacular slates, uh, but they'd also um, done secret gutters behind the parapets. So in here was a small gap because the slates were so close to the parapet copings, they created a, a little lead gully, which was hidden by the last slate. And they obviously thought this was very neat detail, but actually the, um, the implications were that um, the secret gutter almost probably instantly got uh, uh, filled with debris or a small amount of debris, which then created a, an avalanche of more debris. So it wasn't a secret gutter anymore. It was just a, a sponge drawing water that was then being sucked into the wall head of the, uh, the elevation. So the gable became very wet and it was a south gable as well. So driving rain, you know, it's a, it's a kind of perfect scenario for, for water ingress that can then not get out because of the cement render. So, so the very basic proposals here were to, um, to stop the water coming in by improving the, the lead details. Now we couldn't see these from the ground. It was only when we got the scaffolding up that we could make a, a better assessment and also then take the render off to allow us to make a better assessment of uh, what we had in terms of the substrate. We did take a sample of this render to just reassure ourselves that we weren't removing something that was precious and to get an idea of um, different types of render because there were very many different patches. And I would recommend doing that because it may be that one of the patches on your building is, um, is actually the original render. And what, that's what we were looking for here. Sorry, I'm flicking back. Um, because we were trying to find out what the, the mortars were so that we could create a repair mortar which will be sympathetic to the substrate. So once we had the render off, we did actually take another sample of the bedding mortar between the, uh, the sandstone blocks to assess the original uh, pointing, which was a uh, lime-based uh, lime mortar and found that that had been uh, hoxed. Uh, so, um, so I'll come on to this later, but we found out what the mix was. And, and so we could replicate that and move forwards into our schedule of works. Now, because this was grant-aided, it, uh, it, it was classed as urgent works, but we did manage to, to squeeze in some other elements. And this is just a, just a, uh, a look at the very, the very basic schedule and specification for what we were doing. Some of it was standstone uh, replacements to uh, copings, but also window surrounds. But the thing that I've highlighted here is that um, what we were trying to do is look at how the building was performing and see how we could, with appropriate materials, improve its uh, and enhance its performance. So yes, obviously the cement render on the outside was trapping in water, which ultimately was filling up the, the solid masonry wall uh, that, that was then decaying internal plaster. Uh, and I, I'll show you photographs as we move along, but that gave us the opportunity that yes, this rotten plaster had to be, uh, well, it was falling off. So where it, where it was still there, we removed it and had the opportunity to then to put back a still a lime plaster, but a lime plaster that was introducing um, hemp into it uh, to, to allow it to be an insulating line plaster to try and um, create a still a homogeneous uh, section through the wall, not creating voids or cavities where you can get quite uh, distinct changes in temperature. And these are the danger points for interstitial condensation. So it still was homogeneous, just like the original line plaster, but it had additional properties um, which would allow it to perform better. So that's, I suppose, a material which, yes, it's, um, we're using lime because that's what was there, but the idea of using hemp is, is, or cork or those things is actually quite a modern uh, idea. And 
and within conservation there is room to do that i think there's room for for materials new materials that can um, sit side by side with the historic fabric so i don't i don't think we should be hair shirts about it. it must be the way it had been um, critically here as well um, we did look into and have you know um, been aware of research that's looked into historic fabric and uh, internal insulation. And there can be um, issues with lateral walls, but also uh, the benefit of concentrating on reveals. I, I said earlier that uh, reveals to windows and doors are the weak points in the building. That is where solid masonry can really um, not fail, but that's where cold bridging can drive uh, cold air and condensation to the inside of the uh, inside of the property so doing a small amount of insulation to the reveals can have a, a significantly positive impact on the performance of the uh, the internal space and also um i don't know how many of you are aware of diane hubbard and she does uh, thermal imaging and and is a great um uh, advocator for trying to airtight around leaky windows and by leaky windows i don't actually mean the the rattly sashes uh, what i mean is the edges of the windows where they are fitted into the wall so the, these areas here are, are places where we should um you know just take a little bit of time to think about how it's fitted in obviously they're uh, pegged and screwed in place but cold air can actually um uh, go around the back, sneaky around the back of the window. And so things like a wet plaster and a wet insulating plaster with, with a taped edge can really improve the performance of uh, window openings, door openings, and reduce that um, exposure you get in those places. One of the only other things that we did here was we had rising ground. So we, uh, but limited access to what we could do there. Uh, was to try and make uh, a slightly less impervious hard standing up against the building at points where the ground level externally had risen up above the floor level internally. So, uh, so we made a much more open, free draining uh, base to, um, to, to the wall and put in um, traditional sets, which I know they're not very pervious in themselves, uh, but within a within a, a softer biscuit mix um, to allow uh, water that does get below and into the ground underneath what had been tarmac, but in this case uh, is now going to be the sets, but with a very much open draining um, channel that can allow water to uh, to move away from from the wall itself um, and and get to the uh, the perforated land drain that we then eventually put into it. So once we we're on site and we'd taken off the render and could see the building, we then went back to do a little bit more investigation. I mean, again, this was a luxury that we had because English Heritage were involved, but it did give us time to rethink on, on certain elements and to discover other things as well. This window had been uh, been blocked up and hidden and is actually part of the original um, 17th century design with its stone chamfered uh, and mullioned window. Um, so quite interesting and part of uh, at the height that it's at, the window next to it is actually a modern stair window, but the, this had potentially been a stair in the early design. And also again, uh, in the top right set of pictures, another window in the, the gable, which was a complete shock to everybody nobody knew that that was there at all so very very interesting and also this gable um you can just about make out here uh, that there's a quite a distinct line where we had uh, large sandstone blocks up to a certain point and then beyond it a very very different um smaller sandstone uh, rubble uh, which indicated that originally the the roof had been much much steeper and there'd been a lower eaves um and with this steepness there is a suggestion that it could potentially have been a thatched roof on the moot hall which is quite a find uh, and it makes sense because other buildings along the borough gate in appleby had been um thatched to um, 
to just into the 20th century and there are photographic evidence i think probably one of my earlier photographs showed them i forgot to mention uh, so thatch on the moot hall so it just allows us to see how the buildings have evolved and that they're not uh, frozen in aspect we can say that we are evolving these buildings as we try to um, improve their performance um, and to kind of regain a, an equilibrium in them so very interesting uh, yes, more uh, more drawings which indicated what we'd found, um, and then uh, structure. This is a structure engineer Charles Blackington, who actually uh, lives in um, in Appleby. Um, we had the opportunity then to look at some of the um, structure within the wall, which had been adversely affected by the building being encased in a cement render. And there were some fairly um, epic voids in there that we uh, that we realised needed to be filled and um, lintels replaced. So quite useful to be able to do that. Also, that once we've removed the masonry paint which had been on the uh, window stone surrounds, we realised what uh, poor condition they were in. I'll show you some pictures later uh, because of the the masonry paint. They had um, they had been basically encased, and sandstone, as as some of you will probably know, is um, is quite susceptible to, when it's saturated to losing its binder and reverting back to sand. So when we uh, removed the masonry paint, uh, we found quite a lot of unstable stonework, which we had anticipated, but um, it was it was worse than uh, we we uh, we realized and and that there we um, used um, new sandstone uh, St Bees as it was to match uh, to 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 indent and to replace where we needed so part of the thing for Moot Hall was uh, trying to um, have a commute have a communication with the locals as to uh, how the building works what's gone wrong with it uh, how we can fix it and this was um, one of the displays that we had for the building, just to show um, the elements that which they thought were there and had been there forever, um, because it, it's everybody's used to it being black and white. And um, we found as we did some uh, paint great makes it sound quite scientific, but we just peeled off some of the paint to find out what the layers of paint were behind it, and actually surprisingly and exciting when we found that there was quite a lot of colour involved in Moot Hall uh, and in fact now um, we've had um, agreement with the town council and the list of voter consent is, is ongoing for um, colour to be put back to Moot Hall, a very subtle um, uh, light ochre, so a, a kind of warm yellow uh, to the main render and the um, the surrounds themselves will be um, will be a brown. So it'd be quite a di different change to this, and it's been quite a uh, an emotional um, discussion with um, stakeholders, not only Appleby Town Council, but with uh, residents to discuss how this building has evolved from that thatched building uh, through coloured lime washes to this black and white cement render. So. I've put in some some elements here, which are very, uh, I don't know if, if, if anybody's familiar with the Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings, um, but their philosophy is guides me and it's a sort of starting point. And um, I feel that that's a good place to start. Not, not necessarily the way you're going to end, but it's a good checkpoint to make you think about uh, the consequences of what we're doing because even the people who put the cement render on were doing it in good faith, thinking that they were repairing this building and saving it for the future. And little did they know that actually that was going to be uh, part of the problem. So it's about uh, looking at these, I won't read through this, uh, but it's about looking at um, the way a building functions and the materials and techniques that are used and anything new that we do needs to be within a historic context, needs to be sympathetic to that. Um, so that the, you know, the new is gonna to fit to the old, but perform sympathetically with the old. Uh, and so you need to understand that traditional construction 
It's not a cavity wall uh, with a damp proof course. And if you try and make it into a, a, a modern building by injecting a damp proof course or by uh, tanking it to, uh, to seemingly make it dry, these are uh, short term or ineffective on the whole ways of trying to deal with a building that had an equilibrium at some point in the past and through um, the best intentions might have had that thrown off kilter. And it's all about um, porosity, uh, as some people call breathability of buildings to allow them to, to function so that, uh, so that the water can be drawn into uh, the pointing and then taken out to the exterior and if it's got a render on it, have a really large surface area to, to get rid of that moisture. One of, the, one of the obsessions about water in the wall is because the bottom line is that a, a wet wall is a cold wall and, uh, and conduct, you know, it, it has a massive difference of performance of the building. So simply by drying out a building, even if you were not to insulate it, but by making it perform correctly, it will become a, lot, a much warmer building. So by plugging it with cement, uh, you then start to create issues of uh, water trying to find other routes. And that can be quite deleterious to uh, historic fabric. And that's where things like sandstone start to decay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna whiz through this stuff because I realize I'm uh, taking far too much time. Lime cycle, it's an amazing thing. Lime is probably one of the most sustainable things. Uh, and historically has been, the glue in most of our buildings. I don't think we should underestimate the fact that whatever we do uh, should be, um, with historic buildings, should be uh, based around how that performs. Even if we're not using lime, we should be using substances which can be sympathetic to the way that the building and its glue works. This is a slightly <laughs> a boring slide of the samples that we uh, went through to try and get uh, a correct mix for this building. And it, I only put that up because it is worth doing some samples to try and work out how a uh, building works, even if that is uh, how your insulation is going to fit. It might be that you uh, temporarily uh, choose uh, your worst wall and, and, and work on it. Uh, I, I myself am working on my own um, house and trying to work on a very, very poorly, uh, uh, wet wall to dry it out, but also to to use uh, insulation internally and how that is affecting lateral walls, which by default become colder because if you put insulation on the inside, the wall itself becomes colder. That affects the um, the dew point, which actually gets closer to the inside face of the wall. So uh, that's why we're very um, conscious of cavities because then the cavity can become uh, a trap for insulation, uh, interstitial condensation. So, um, so, so I'm experimenting at the moment and trying to see how the insulation on the internal face is affecting lateral walls, um, because these unintended consequences mean that cold is now drawing through the lateral wall, and at that point. Um, that the, the lateral wall is, is quite a lot colder. So quicklime, it's, uh, it's something which has been around for centuries, but actually seems to have been forgotten and uh, is now being seen as probably the way that most mortars were made. It's something we've we found with the samples at Moot Hall, where there were inclusions of lime uh, and other little telltale elements, which allowed us to realize that um, the mortar was made by having uh, the quicklime from, uh, from somewhere like SAP uh, mixed with the mortar uh, and, and then water added, sorry, mixed with the aggregates and then water added to that so that uh, the, uh, the slaking process of lime uh, is done in conjunction with the mortar, which um, tends to make a much um, fatter mix, a much stickier mix uh, which can then uh, be more easily applied. And if applied hot, um, I is still in the process of uh, slaking, so it is still expanding, seems to reduce uh, uh, suction and also uh, shrinkage. Uh, so we're, we're, we're seeing that actually it's quite an obvious thing. It's, it's a very easy production. 
to do and with a little bit of health and safety uh, consideration in the first place uh, can be a relatively safe process. I think it, it might be worth saying that it's probably best done by somebody who's experienced or at least to be taught how to do it and there are plenty of um, courses now uh, that uh, extol this uh, as a way if you are hands-on and wanting to do it yourself. If you're not, then there are uh, suppliers of uh, pre-hot mixed cold uh, uh, aggregates that, uh, and mortars that you can get uh, within within the county. There is a chap uh, near to uh, Kirby Stephen who uh, who supplies, and there are, there are many others as well. So uh, so you can see here this this is a a, a, built, a picture of another building where we uh, we re-rendered. Uh, where it had had um, cement um, uh, rough cast, which a, uh, a previous team had taken off and then tried to uh, use a, an inappropriate pointing, a very, very hard line, um, naturally hydraulic line in the joints. And uh, when that hadn't worked, had looked at uh, a silane, so a, um, a film, basically, to uh, a waterproofing which is uh, supposed to be um, uh, breathable, but in this instance had uh, caused a lot of water ingress. And part of it was to do with, yes, these materials, but part of it was also to do with basic detailing. Um, the, the lead work around the windows, the new lead work around the windows was all cut short, allowing uh, bridging for water and hadn't gone, hadn't appreciated the makeup of the wall. So water, which was going into the wall, and then percolating down the inside of the external skin of stone was bypassing the lead work. So by improving that lead detail to capture uh, water that which naturally goes through the wall uh, and then taking it to the outside um, meant that we dried out those reveals that we were talking about earlier. And then we rendered it with a, uh, with a lime render, which allowed it to um, starts to slowly this building has in some instances nine foot thick walls in, in part of it so a long process of drying out but uh, by getting the right materials in place um, you can you can start this process and it will eventually uh, get it back to its equilibrium this is just another lovely example of a lime render there uh, this time there were porcelains used in this and i don't want to get into the details uh, having looked at the um, um, the, the experience, but Pozzoline is just another way of making a lime mortar uh, go off. It's, it gives it a chemical set. So the, the lime can be made more durable or, or, uh, or less durable, depending on its exposure. Obviously a church tower, uh, the higher up, the more exposure. And so different mixes have been used in different places. It is worth bearing that in mind if, you, if your property is two, three stories high, that potentially you might need to look at different Different, different mixes. So on the Moot Hall, once we've taken the render off, we found this is a slightly after shot. This was a massive hole. So it was about a dubbing out, repointing, deep pack pointing to, uh, to get the material and the, 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 the substrate back into sound, sound condition. And so this, this slide on the left is uh, some deep pack pointing and pinning or gamuting which is using large stones to, uh, uh, to pack into big voids, like you saw Charles putting his hand into. I think this is, this is actually that hole. And then the next slide is we started to put leveling out coats and you can see the size of, of the aggregate in the mortars there. And, and as we were doing this, we could see, um, we could actually see that the walls were drying out. These are the stone reveals that I was talking about. Um, where because of the masonry paint creating a quite hard skin, uh, it was creating cavities behind it. Uh, so the decision was made that uh, we would remove the, um, the masonry paint back to the sandstone and put indents, which are slips of stone in where we could, uh, or where in this case, it slightly lost its integrity and there was a hollow behind it was to replace that section of stone. Because this was having knock on effect on window surrounds and sills. Another thing here that had created part of the issue was it had window boxes with plants 
and watering system, so uh, which was actually watering the sills. So these are the original uh, 17th century um, sash, sashes, which have been deemed to be quite rare, and they were getting watered, uh, you know, daily with the uh, the plant pots. So we have uh, agreed, uh, and the, the Appleby Town Council have agreed to remove the window boxes and, and try and. Uh, liven up the building in some other way that's not quite so damaging to it. Um, so this is us starting to now put back what had been there. Um, so this is our, on the left hand side, I must apologise that has rotated that image. It's gone around, but the uh, this is the top of the, the window, that's the sill. These two are replacement uh, stone in so we took samples and looked at local uh, stones like Lazenby and St. Bees, uh, which are red sandstones. And in this instance, the, the, uh, the St. Bees was the closest match uh, in terms of kind of porosity to the existing. So we used that and cut sample. And we're now here just putting on um, first coats of a lime wash, which has uh, a small amount of linseed oil in it. The linseed oil helps it to adhere to uh, stonework uh, when you use it in low levels, uh, uh, low percentages. So the right hand side is us um, just making an indent out of one of those windows that have been hidden to give a hint of uh, the previous uses in the building whilst, whilst still protecting it. Um, internally, so this is the uh, this is the inside of the council chamber, uh, stripped out. I don't know if people can see over on the right. I just see a picture of me and uh, Tina. But on the right hand side is an image of the uh, the, the original uh, or how it had been before we started repairing it. And I don't know whether you can see in the far corner that was where the plaster was coming away. Uh, and on the ceiling there were applied boards around the original uh, beams and um, ventilation to the uh, to the to the void above so our concentration here was trying to obviously make the building work again uh, with uh, with the right materials but to try and enhance its performance and that's where we've used the uh, the lime um, the lime hemp insulation on the walls roughly up to about 50 i mean it varies because the walls are so uh, wobbly but uh, about 50 50 mil of uh, lime crete insulation on the walls but also the uh, the ceiling um, which was a slightly um, um, something which was not in poor condition but we did it to try and improve the performance of the room so it's had a lath and plaster ceiling which is still there and what we did was uh, Sheep's wool insulation over the top of that, but then a wood fiber board uh, fixed to the underside. So it was undercloaked with a wood fiber board, which was then given a lime uh, skim to it. Um, so that those two elements together would increase the uh, insulation to the ceiling. And then we improved the insulation to the roof void um, to allow um, air changes within the roof void, which now could be cold and well vented. Um, yeah, so we are probably now a little bit further on than that, but not much further. Uh, we're, so, we're, but we are very close to completion. So here we've got the the, the finish to the uh, to the lime hemp. Uh, in certain jobs, we've left it so that you can actually see the hemp. It's got quite a nice finish here. But here, because of its high status, uh, they wanted to um, to make it so it was a smooth plaster, which of course it can be. Uh, and we also took the opportunity, it had some redundant um, um, kind of inefficient fins, well, I'm not sure they were fin, convector heaters at low level on the skirts, um, which were turned on and put on high uh, before every meeting, but then the rooms were left to go cold uh, and they were really ineffective. Most, most of the um, councillors would sit around the, the outside of the room to try and capture as much of the heat as they could from those. So we we then, once we'd in, improved the insulation, looked at how um, what, what, what we needed in terms of heating 
and went uh, to uh, back to um, a radiator. We had the room to do it here, and they were, you know, they're far more, in this instance, far more efficient way of getting heat into this room and kind of more appropriate to the to the way that the building works. So we're we're close to finishing there. Uh, oh, and I think that I think that might be me. I hope, hope that was of use. That's really interesting. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, you know, I certainly found there's a lot in there that I didn't really know at all about the, the Moot Hall and really interested to see it. So what I'd like to do now, if you want to stop sharing your screen for a moment, and what I'll do is um, just to get us ready for the... Um, for the, so, so now, following the, the talk, there's an opportunity for everyone to put your questions to Paul. Uh, so I would encourage you now, if you've thought of something, to start writing in the Q&A. So not in the chat, but in the Q&A. If you start putting some questions into the Q&A, then I will be able to ask them um, to Paul. And what I did want to say was that just to recap while people are thinking of questions, to say that um, just to go over the fact that this, the work that you've been doing, Paul, has been made possible by a combination of, of different organisations, which I think uh, Historic England uh, was part of the Heritage Action Zone within yes. Appleby yes. and <laughs> supported as well by the Town Council. Is that, yeah. That's correct. Yes, that's absolutely right. And Eden District Council as well were involved. As well. yeah. yeah, yeah, yes. But yeah, yeah I did. I did mention that the so Appleby has got a heritage action zone, which is looking at many, many buildings, trying to encourage uh, um, people to take the opportunity and the grants to improve the streetscape. And Moot Hall is slap bang in the middle of Burrogate, so that uh, was a good use of it. But actually, I think Eden was certainly trying to encourage. Uh, individuals to use that money and and some of them have definitely taken it up so it's, right, it's right. yes little, well, because, little incremental changes right no that's great yes because this this presentation and, and other work that CAFS has been able to do is also supported by um, Historic England and and this collaboration so it's really brilliant that we've a, been able to bring the Moot Hall back to its former glory but also to be able to share that information with um, with people of Appleby and, and across Cumbria as well. Um, so, right, everyone's question has been answered, but obviously you've given us some really useful information about various organisations that can um, give us pointers in the right direction for different kinds of expertise that we might need. Um, for people with um, other kinds of advice, as I say, CAFs can do a short advice call or a, a free retrofit consultation by phone. I would say we're not so we're not providing the kind of absolute specialist advice that you're talking about when you're getting a, a, a um, an architect from one of those specialist organisations. We tend to deal with fairly general advice, but we do have heritage building expertise on the team as well. So. Um, we also offer these whole house energy audits, which can calculate the heat loss of a building and can help people to work out what their whole house plan might be and work out and compare different scenarios, whether you put a bit of insulation here or there or all over and, and how you do it. So we've got um, things that can help with heritage buildings, but also an awareness that you don't over insulate a heritage building. So, um, you know, the energy modelling is important, but it's um it's got to be done in conjunction with the maintenance and the whole seeing the building in a holistic way and and making sure everything that's done is appropriate for for the kind of building that you're dealing with so that's that's CAF's contact details and um just to let everyone know we have some future webinars coming up uh, our retrofit series um units two to four and a repeat of unit one for anyone who missed it um, we've got installing windows for those people who are looking at choosing perhaps triple glazed windows or whether to choose triple glazed windows or double glazed windows and how to install that whichever windows you get how to install them well so finally I'd just like to say a really big thanks to you Paul for a really really interesting talk um, 
really looking forward to see the Moot Hall reappear in April. <laughs> and um, also I'd like to really thank the audience, all of you, for some very interesting questions. And uh, thank you to Paul for answering every question that uh, that um, <laughs> that came along. That's been it's been really great. It's been wonderful to to have you on on this webinar. And so I'd just like to say a final um, a final thank you. And just to remind people, sign up to the CAFS newsletter if you want to be told about more webinars. Join another webinar in the future. Um, I'll send out an email after this um, anyway, probably tomorrow or next week, with um, links and information, and and uh, you can can use those. And and thank you to those of you who've donated to CAFS um, when when you've signed on to these webinars. And yeah, and thank you of course to our funders who have supported these the work on Appleby Moot Hall and also. Um, this this webinar and and other work that CAFS has done in Appleby. Thank you very much. <laughs>